Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be with you. I, uh, I want to apologize. Some of you have probably heard me uh, talk before. It happens. Um, I was speaking at a foster grandparents gathering uh, some years ago, and uh, I had spoken at it the summer before. I don't know why they invited me two summers in a row, but uh, after the second talk, a, a grandmother came up to me. I think she liked the talk. She had big tears in her eyes, and she grabbed both my hands, and she said, I heard you last year. It never gets better. <laughs> so, kind of kind of hoping she was misspeaking there. Um, <laughs> anyway, thank you for your attention. You know, uh, anybody uh, just wants some attention, especially folks on the margins. I had a homie, a gang member, uh, step into my office the other day, very earnest 16-year-old gang member, standing in front of my desk, and he says, look, I need your divided attention. <laughs> I said, you are in luck. Uh, <clears throat> You know, I suppose there's a vision that brings you to a place like this a theater for the day, and it's a vision of wanting to see the world uh, looking differently than it currently looks. The prophet Habakkuk writes, the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint, and if it delays, wait for it. But nobody wants to wait for too long. Uh, we want to make something happen, and that's what I want to suggest in the brief time I have with you that what we all want to create and form is a community of kinship such that God, in fact, might recognize it. I suspect that Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we uh, create and imagine a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? And to that end, what we hope to do, all of us, I think, is to inch our way out to the margins so that we can stand with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless, uh, that we can stand with those whose dignity has been denied, with those whose burdens are more than they can bear. Occasionally, you get very fortunate and blessed to be able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized so that the demonizing will stop. And with the disposable, so that the day will come when we stop throwing people away. I suspect that if kinship was our goal, we would no longer be promoting justice. We would, in fact, be celebrating it. For no kinship, no justice. No kinship, no peace. So for 25 years, it's been the privilege of my life to work uh, with gang members, and they've taught me everything of value, really. Uh, but especially in the last couple of years, they taught me how to text, and I'm so grateful to them. I, uh, I find that it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. And, and so I'm pretty dexterous at it, LOL and OMG and BTW, you know, and, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. And uh, I've been using that one quite a bit lately. And <clears throat> so there I am with two homies, Manuel and Boncho. They're older vatos who work in my, uh, at Homeboy Industries. We have 400 employees there. And guys have been to prison and tattooed. They do a variety of things. They're going to help me give a talk in Palm Desert at a high school. And so we meet at 9. We get in the car. 15 minutes on the road, Manuel's in the front seat. And he gets an incoming text. And he chuckles to himself. And I said, what is it? He goes, oh, it's dumb, it's from Snoopy, back at the office. Well, I'd just seen Snoopy. Snoopy gave me a big abrazote as the day began, and Snoopy and Manuel work together in the clock-in room where they clock in all our, uh, all our workers. It's a tough job. I said, well, what's he say? Oh, gosh, hang on, it's dumb. Hey, dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up at county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> well, we died laughing, you know, and then I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies, rivals. They used to shoot bullets at each other. Now they shoot text messages. 
And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How can we achieve a certain kind of compassion that stands in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it? For the measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them, in mutuality. It was a great privilege of my life to uh, know Cesar Chavez as a friend, and I can remember once a reporter had commented to him, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Cesar just shrugged and smiled, and he says, the feeling's mutual. And that's what we want to achieve, is this sense of mutuality, where we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we're separate. No us and them, just us. For there's an idea that's taken root in the world, it's at the root of all that's wrong with it, and the idea would be this, that there just might be lives out there that matter less than other lives. How do we stand against that idea? Well, Homeboy Industries was born uh, nearly 25 years ago when I was pastor of the poorest parish in the city of Los Angeles, Dolores Mission, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, Pico Gardens and Aliso Village, at the time, they comprised the largest grouping of public housing west of the Mississippi. We had eight gangs there, uh, half of those gangs at war with the other half. Uh, I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness in 1988, and I buried my uh, 180th uh, some months ago. We did a lot of things. We started a school and then a jobs program, and when we couldn't find enough jobs, we Started our first business, Homeboy Bakery, in 1992. A month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. And not everything worked. You know, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy Plumbing was not a huge success. Uh, <laughs> who knew people didn't want gang members in their homes? I, I, did, I did not see that coming. And now we, we didn't intend to do this, but uh, we have backed our way into becoming the largest gang intervention rehab and reentry center in the country. Uh, so 15,000 folks a year walk through our doors. Keep in mind there are 1,100 gangs in LA County and uh, 86,000 gang members. And so you name anything that might be helpful, we do it from curricular things like anger management and parenting. Lots and lots of mental health counselors, case managers, job developers, uh, free tattoo removal. Uh, no place on the planet removes more tattoos than we do. Uh, we have a designated clinic, uh, three laser machines, 29 doctors, 800 treatments uh, a month. And it was all started because of a guy named Frank who wandered out of Corcoran State Prison, two days out of prison, and he wanders into my office and he's sitting in front of me and tattooed on his forehead like a, a banner, or like a billboard, and pardon my French, it says, fuck the world. Wow. Yeah. And he said, um, you know, I'm having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, uh, well, uh, Frank, uh, you know, maybe we could put our heads together on this one, you know. <laughs> So anyway, I found a doctor who donated some time, and little by little, we chipped away at his forehead. <laughs> and we have our chips and salsas and all the Ralphs and uh, Food for Less, and we have uh, Homeboy Diner, the only place you can get food in the city hall. Uh, we're about to move into the LAX, uh, American Airlines Terminal. We'll have put a restaurant there. Um, Homeboy uh, Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise, where we sell our logo stuff. Uh, we're in 24 different uh, farmers' markets. Uh, where we have the solar panel installation training program. And Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, uh, <laughs> will gladly take your order. Uh, last year, you know, at the cafe, we had a visit from Diane Keaton, the Oscar-winning actress, uh, movie star, Annie Hall, Godfather movies, and she's there with a regular guy who's there once a week, and her waitress this day is Glinda, and Glinda's a homegirl, been there, done that, uh, tattooed, been to prison, a felon, a parolee. She doesn't know who Diane Keaton is, and so she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, what do you recommend? And uh, Glinda rattles off the three platillos that she particularly likes, and 
And Diane Keaton says, I'll have that second one. That sounds good. And then something dawns on Glenda at exactly that moment. She says, wait a minute. I, I feel like I know you from somewhere. Like, maybe we've met. <laughs> and uh, Diane Keaton decides to deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I suppose I have one of those faces, you know, that people think they've seen before. And then Glenda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <laughs> Uh, that just took my breath away when I heard it, and uh, I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings since that moment. <laughs> but suddenly, kinship so quickly, Oscar-winning actress, attitudinal waitress, exactly what God had in mind, and if you'll permit me to uh, speak for God, uh, Jesus says it pretty clearly, that you may be one, that's the whole thing, that you may be one, that's the hope, anyway. All of us are called to be what Alice Miller, the late great child psychologist, calls enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused, attentive love return people to themselves. You don't hold the bar up and ask anybody to measure up. You just show up and you hold the mirror up and you tell people the truth. You say, you are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. And then you watch people become that truth. You watch them inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep it out. And death can't touch it because it's huge. But sometimes you have to reach in and dismantle messages of shame and disgrace that get in the way so that the soul can feel its worth. Uh, no homie resisted my offers of help more than a kid named Bandit. Uh, he was a gang member, lived in Aliso Village, housing projects. I would ride my bike in the middle of the night, and I'd uh, see him run up to cars and sell crack cocaine and walk away counting his money. I'd say, how about a real job? And he was very polite, you know. Uh, That's okay, G, thanks, though. Until one day, 15 years ago, he shows up in my office. I couldn't believe he was there. And he says what gang members often say, I'm tired of being tired. So I walked him to one of our job developers, and as luck would have it, they located an entry-level, unskilled, low-paying job, first kind of job in a warehouse. Now cut to today, Bandit runs the whole thing. He's the supervisor of the supervisors. Owns his own home. He's married, has three kids. Well, I hadn't heard from him in, in like two years, and he calls me one Friday afternoon a little bit, breathless and panicky. He says, gee, you got to bless my daughter. I said, que paso, mico? Is she sick? Is she in the hospital? Oh, no, no. On Sunday, she's going to Humboldt College. <laughs> Imagine my oldest, she's going to college, but she's a little chaparita and we're afraid for her. You, you think there's you, any way you could give her a blessing before she goes? I go, are you kidding? I, I'd be honored. Look, tomorrow's Saturday. I have baptisms at 1.00. Why don't you come at 12.30, we'll do a little send-off. And sure enough, Bandit and his wife and the three kids show up at 12.30. And we uh, situate everybody in front of the altar. And I say, well, let's put Jessica in the middle. Let's surround her with our bodies and with our love. Everybody touch her, connect to her, put your hands on her shoulder, on, on her arms. Go ahead, put your hands on her head. And I say, you know, bow your heads, close your eyes. And as the homies say, I do a long-ass prayer. You know, I go on and on and... <laughs> And, and somewhere in the middle of this prayer, I notice we've all become chiones, you know, we're all crying, we're all sniffling, I don't know why we're crying. Except for the fact that Bandit and his wife don't know anybody who's ever gone to college except me. Certainly nobody in their families. So, you know, we kind of wipe our eyes and we laugh about how mushy we got. And, and so to change the subject, I look at Jessica, hey, what are you going to study? at Humboldt College. She was very quick. Forensic psychology. I go, damn, forensic psychology. <laughs> and Bandit chimes in, yeah, she wants to study the criminal mind. <laughs> and uh, Jessica, very deadpan, looks at her father and she does one of these. You know. <laughs> and, and he sees her and says, yeah, I'm going to be her first subject. So we walk up to the car and big abrazos and they pile in the car, but Bandit hangs back. I'm glad he has. And I say, hey, 
Can I tell you something? I give you credit for the man you've chosen to become, for choosing to walk in your own footsteps. I'm proud of you. And his eyes well up with tears. And he says, Sabes que? I'm proud of myself. All my life, people called me a low life, a bueno para nada, a good for nothing. I guess I showed him. I said, yeah, I guess you did. And the soul feels its worth. People always ask me about enemies who work together. It's kind of tense at first. A homie will come in and say, I'm ready, I'm ready. And I'll say, okay, I have an opening in the bakery, but you have to work with X, Y, and Z. And I rattle off the names of rivals. And they always say the same thing. They always say, uh, I'll work with them, but I'm not going to talk to them. <laughs> but, you know, that used to bother me in the early days. But, you know, the truth is, human beings can't demonize people they know. It's hard to sustain that, really. So I had a homie named uh, Youngster, a little tiny guy. Everybody called him Youngster. And he, I thought he was ready, so I bring him into the Homeboy uh, Silkscreen factory, and I introduce him to all his 30 co-workers. That's our biggest business, huge factory. And I watch him as he shakes hands with everybody, looking them in the eyes, even enemies, until he gets to the last guy, a guy everybody called Puppet, and Puppet seems to be avoiding this encounter altogether. And when Puppet and Youngster are in each other's vicinity, they kind of mumble something. They stare at their shoes. They don't shake hands. Well, I know they're enemies, but he just finished shaking hands with other enemies. I discover later that this is uh, a hatred that's quite personal and deep, beyond which neither of them think they can get past. So I sense that at the moment, and I say, hey, if you guys can't hang working together, let me know. I got a bunch of people who want this job. And they say nothing. Six months later, Puppet is walking to a corner store not far from his home and buys something. And, but on the way home, he kind of takes a detour, a shortcut, cuts into an alley. Suddenly, he's surrounded by ten members of a rival gang, ten against one. They beat him badly. He falls to the ground. While he's lying on the ground, they will not stop kicking his head until he's lying there lifeless. Somebody finds his body, takes him to White Memorial Hospital, where he's declared effectively brain dead, though it's the policy there to keep you connected to machines for 48 hours so the doctors can get two days of a flat read, then they sign the death certificate. This allowed family and friends to gather. I was in St. Louis University giving a talk. I flew home. I've seen a lot of horrible things in my life. Uh, but nothing to compare to the sight of this young man with his head swollen many, many times its size. It, it was horrifying. You could barely train your eyes on him. So at the end of the 48-hour period, I gave him a blessing. I anointed his forehead with oil. We disconnected. And a week later, I buried him. But in the first 24 hours, I'm alone in my office. It's 8.30 at night. And the phone rings, and it's youngster from the silkscreen factory, Puppet's co-worker. Hey, he says, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. I said, yeah, it is. And then with a certain kind of eagerness even, he says, is there anything I can do? Can I give him my blood? And we both fall silent under the weight of it until finally he breaks the silence, choking back his tears, and he says with great deliberation, he was not my enemy. He was my friend. We worked together. Now, can I say that always happens at Homeboy Industries? Yeah. Any exceptions? No. No. And it shouldn't surprise us that God's own dream come true for us, that we be one, just happens to be our own deepest longing for ourselves. It turns out it's mutual. For the vision still has its time, presses on to fulfillment, and it will not disappoint 
And if it delays, we can wait for it. Thank you very much. Thank you.